Magnets are one of those everyday objects we hardly think about, yet they are quietly shaping the world around us. Your phone's speakers, your laptop's hard drive, even the MRI machines in hospitals owe their existence to magnets. And here's a strange little fact to kick things off. Yeah, bitch! Magnets! If you break a bar magnet in half, you don't end up with a north end and a south end. Each piece becomes its own miniature magnet with its own north and south poles. No matter how many times you break it apart, you'll never isolate a single pole. That's the kind of weirdness hiding in plain sight. And if you're curious about more oddities like this, stick around and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next weird factory secret. Okay, let's dive in. Now, let's go inside the foundry and see how magnets are really made. Raw material selection and alloy composition. Magnets aren't all the same. Some are naturally magnetic like lodestone, a mineral that ancient sailors used as a compass. Others are permanent magnets, materials that retain their magnetic properties once they have been exposed to a strong field. Then there are electromagnets, which only generate a magnetic force when an electric current runs through a coil wrapped around them. The magnets we use most in industry, however, come from carefully engineered alloys. One common family is alnico magnets, made of aluminum, nickel, and cobalt. Extra ingredients like copper, iron, and titanium are often added to tweak the properties. The recipe matters. Change the proportions slightly, and you could weaken the magnet, make it unstable at high temperatures, or shift its durability. The science of magnet making begins long before a furnace is lit. It starts with metallurgists choosing the exact cocktail of metals that will produce the right balance of strength and stability. Casting process. With the materials chosen, the next step is to create a mold. These molds are usually made of sand, the cheap and durable material that can survive molten metal at thousands of degrees. The process begins with what is essentially a stamp or pattern of the magnet shape. Workers load this pattern into a machine that packs sand tightly around it. The block of sand is removed and gases are pumped into it, hardening the sand chemically in a matter of seconds. When the pattern is pulled away, the sand slab now contains a perfect cavity shaped like the magnet. This casting step is more than just making shapes. The mold sets the basic geometry of the magnet and creates the foundation for every stage that follows, from heat treatment to machining. In other words, if the mold is off, the final magnet will be off. Alloy melting and homogenization. Now comes the fiery part. The metals are placed in an induction furnace, a piece of equipment that can reach temperatures of up to 1700 degrees Celsius, hotter than the surface of some volcanoes. Unlike traditional furnaces, an induction furnace uses electromagnetic fields to generate heat directly inside the metals. The coil surrounding the crucible produces alternating currents that agitate the atoms until the metals liquefy into a glowing molten soup. At this stage, it's not just about melting. The alloy must be homogenized so that aluminum, nickel, cobalt, and all the other elements are evenly distributed. If one part of the molten mix has more nickel than another, the final magnet will be inconsistent, with weak and strong spots scattered across it. Stirring, controlled heating, and careful timing all help ensure that the mixture is uniform before it is poured into the waiting sand molds. And if you ever see sparks or flames leaping from the sand as the molten alloy is poured, that is because the hardening gases trapped inside the sand are flammable. The spectacle is dramatic, but it is also part of the process. Cooling and solidification. Once the molds are filled, the metal must cool. In a foundry, this does not happen slowly and gently. Workers knock the sand molds to the ground and break them open with sledgehammers exposing the glowing metal to air so it can cool faster. This rapid cooling, known as quenching, affects the microstructure of the alloy. How fast the alloy solidifies influences the size and arrangement of the crystals that form inside. Fine, tightly packed crystals usually produce magnets with stronger, more reliable magnetic properties. Larger crystals, on the other hand, can weaken performance. Controlling this stage is therefore critical even though it looks like brute force. Preparing for heat treatment. The solid metal shapes look like magnets, but they are not magnetic yet. 
Workers collect the cooled pieces by shoveling everything into a bin and pulling the usable shapes out with a magnet. Once sorted, the pieces are prepared for heat treatment. For example, ring-shaped magnets are threaded onto a copper pipe. This pipe is then placed inside a larger tube, and the empty spaces are filled with silica sand. The sand holds the rings in place, ensuring they will not shift or warp when heated. Both ends of the tube are sealed with concrete, leaving just enough of the copper wire exposed so it can conduct heat properly. It looks more like construction work than precision science, but each step has a purpose. Heat treatment for magnetic optimization. The sealed tube goes into another furnace, where it is heated until red hot. Heat treatment is one of the most critical stages. By controlling the temperature and the rate of heating and cooling, meteorologists can adjust the microstructure of the alloy, boosting properties like coercivity and remanence. Coercivity measures how resistant a magnet is to being demagnetized. Remanence is how strongly the magnet remains magnetized after the external field is removed. Both are essential for creating a permanent magnet that will not lose its strength in normal use. Without heat treatment, the magnet would be weak and unstable, unfit for practical applications. Orienting the magnetic fields. After heat treatment, the metal pieces still need their internal domains aligned. Imagine billions of tiny magnetic arrows inside each piece, all pointing in random directions. To turn them into a real magnet, they must all face the same way. To achieve this, the rings are exposed to a controlled magnetic field. The copper pipe full of rings is slid inside a large solenoid coil. When current flows through the coil, it generates a strong magnetic field that penetrates the rings. This does not fully magnetize them, but it orients their internal domains, lining them up so that when the final magnetization step comes, they will all lock into place. Once the orientation process is done, the concrete seals are broken apart and the rings are removed. They are now mildly magnetic, but more importantly, they are primed to become powerful magnets. Machining and grinding. Magnets are not always cast in the exact shape needed. To fit into motors, sensors, or other devices, they often require precision shaping. Machining and grinding are used to shape off excess material and bring the magnets to exact dimensions. This stage requires careful handling because the material can be brittle. Cutting too aggressively could snap a piece in half. Diamond-coated tools and coolant fluids are often used to prevent cracks and overheating. Final Magnetization the true transformation happens in the magnetization chamber. Here, the shaped and oriented pieces are placed between the poles of a massive electromagnet. The external magnetic field generated is much stronger than in the orientation step. It forces all the domains within the material to lock into alignment, creating a permanent magnet. From this point forward, the piece will remain magnetic unless it is exposed to extremely high temperatures or another powerful opposing magnetic field. The process has given the alloy its final identity. Quality control. Magnets are tested thoroughly before they leave the factory. Their magnetic strength is measured, their dimensions are checked, and their surfaces are inspected for cracks or irregularities. For certain applications, even the slightest variation can mean failure. In something like an MRI machine, an underperforming magnet is not just inefficient, it could be dangerous. Quality control ensures that only magnets meeting strict standards make it into the products we use. The future of magnets. Magnets are not stuck in the past. Researchers are working on new alloys that are stronger, more heat resistant, and less dependent on rare earth elements like neodymium, which can be expensive and environmentally costly to mine. Meanwhile, applications are getting more ambitious. In countries like Japan and China, Powerful electromagnets are already being used to float maglev trains above their tracks. Without wheels touching rails, these trains eliminate friction almost entirely and can reach speeds over 310 miles per hour. They glide so smoothly that passengers barely feel vibration. With fewer moving parts to wear down, they also break down less often, making them both futuristic and practical. Magnets are also central to renewable energy. 
Wind turbines, for instance, use giant permanent magnets in their generators to convert motion into electricity. As the world moves towards cleaner energy, the demand for stronger and more efficient magnets will only grow. So the next time you casually stick a note to your fridge, remember that the same principles are powering some of the most advanced machines humanity has ever built.